Well, you know, it's interesting. One of my, I, I grew up during the space race. One of my earliest memories as a small child was uh, listening on a shortwave radio to the signals coming from the original Sputnik, the first artificial satellite that the Russians launched. In fact, we, we had a neighbor who uh, had learned uh, how to uh, interpret uh, Morse code uh, in uh, during World War II. And, and he came and he wrote down all the characters and we said, well, what does it say? And he said, well, I have no idea because it's in Russian and it's in code, so who knows? But I remember listening to that. And then as I got older, uh, um, uh, the math club I was in in school, we actually got to go and visit a real computer. And I remember watching a guy literally change a program on the computer by literally plugging and unplugging wires, hard wiring, literally the program physical with the physical circuits of the computer. Um, and then of course, I, I as a teenager, uh, watched the moon landing. So uh, by the time I was out of college, had graduated from Yale, I, I uh, uh, was long hooked on technology in the future and very excited about what it meant. Obviously mobile technology, technologies like the internet of things, uh, 3D printing, augmented and virtual reality, blockchain, which I think is a huge one, um, and still watching AI closely the whole time. Now, obviously, in the last six months, we've seen a, a huge change. But artificial intelligence is way more than just the generative AI that has emerged over the last six to eight months with such tools as ChatGPT and Google Bard uh, and uh, Anthropics Claude and, and Microsoft Bing and so forth. As exciting as those are, and those are very important because they bring an awareness of AI to the general public. But I think we also have to keep in mind blockchain. And in a lot of people's minds, blockchain is still very much conflated with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And you can't do Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies without blockchain. But Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is just a tip of the iceberg of business and social applications of blockchain technologies. It's extremely powerful technology uh, that is in the process of rapidly enabling much more effective sharing of data among multiple entities in business and social ecosystems and much more secure uh, control of data than we were able to have previously without blockchain technology. So I think that's very important. Um, <clears throat> Internet of Things has been around in concept, the idea of having sensors that can communicate electronically and that therefore could in theory be connected through the internet, communicate to anything or anyone. Um, that notion has been around for about 20 years, but it's only been in the last three or four years since we've begun to finally see widespread true uh, deployment of true 5G, high bandwidth, uh, high speed, low latency wireless communications, which now means you can communicate with sensors much more widely distributed than was possible before. And so therefore now the Internet of Things has become a viable emerging technology that people are increasingly using in many different applications. And that in turn can be integrated back into tools like blockchain and AI. Let's start with IoT first, maybe because it's a little easier to grasp initially. But basically, uh, an Internet of Things uh, device is a, a small sensor. I mean, it, it can be as, as small as barely visible to the human eye, and very commonly there may be just a couple of millimeters square now, um, that is capable of keeping track of such things as uh, temperature, pressure, moisture, um, where is it physically located, and on the chip has the communications capability to typically now wirelessly communicate this information externally and to receive limited communications and process it. In other words, it might receive communications from an external system saying things like, are you there? Can you report in the currently available data and so forth? So that it's not constantly just broadcasting. It'll also have a typically a tiny little battery in it so that it'll have a life of anywhere from weeks to months to years, which is long enough for whatever purpose it's been designed to collect and disseminate data. Um, 
And um, then Internet of Things devices only make sense in the context of broader systems that are able to pull these devices and collect the data from these devices. And if you're talking about a, a network or an ecosystem that might have hundreds or thousands, or even ultimately in some cases, millions of devices out there to be monitored, uh, and we get up in the millions when you start thinking about things like the entire, monitoring the entire global weather system, uh, for example, um, then A, you've got to have tremendous high speed, high bandwidth communications capabilities to do that. But also, you could never in a thousand years hire enough people to monitor, personally monitor the data coming from all those devices. So you have to have AI tools that can do that and can assimilate the information, analyze it, and then disseminate it out appropriately so that it can be utilized for whatever purpose, whether it's near-term or long-term weather forecasts, whether it is tracking products moving through a supply chain, especially if those products are things like foods or pharmaceuticals that have to be maintained at a particular temperature, let's say, uh, to ensure that all is well, they're on target, they're on track, they're gonna arrive on time and in the kind of condition that they're expected to arrive in. So the Internet of Things um, uh, uh, technology and basically suite of emerging technologies, I think is a very exciting thing for helping us monitor and manage our physical world and interact with it, uh, especially when you integrate it in with AI. Now, blockchain is, is a little subtler and a little more complex, uh, but the notion behind blockchain is how do you have multiple entities in any given ecosystem. It could be, I, I think one of the simplest applications for people to relate to is um, if you think about a supply chain where you might have manufacturers, distributors, and retailers of whatever product it is, but you also have other players. You have uh, logistics carriers that are moving product from the manufacturer to the distributor or from the distributor to the retailer. And you might in international supply chains have government organizations, entities that are involved in regulating the import and export of products, for example, and making sure that they're only allowed in if they've got the right certifications, the right approvals, the right duties have been paid and so forth. How do you share data among multiple different entities where there could be dozens or hundreds or thousands of entities in this ecosystem? and ensure that the data, the latest data that is um, relevant and authorized for any particular entity to be able to see is available for them to see as quickly and easily as possible. Paint a picture of the, of the accessibly near future. Okay, I call these near future scenarios typically looking out, say, three to five years. Let's talk about how life could be different in the future and um, what, uh, what you can do is describe a set of scenarios. We don't have time to go into what all of these is done, but I've had the opportunity to do this many times in many different industries and many different kinds of technologies and applications and have people say, oh, wow, yeah, that would be great. I would love it if we could do that kind of thing in my business or in my public sector organization or whatever it might be across our ecosystem. Um, but how can you do that? Ah, well, here's how that would work. Here are some of the technologies that would make this possible. AI could help you do this at these aspects of it. And blockchain could help you do these aspects of it. And Internet of Things technology might help you do those other aspects of it. And then if they want to drill down into, well, all right, well, how would blockchain do that? Well, again, if you, if you, if you start off with a high level, non-technical explanation, it lets you share data like this. Okay. Well, how does it do that? Was the problem that you don't believe that it does that? Because if you want to, we can drill way deep into the technical uh, details of how it works. If you're that interested in the technical details. Or are you willing to accept that there's enough companies out there that it does work that way and it's simply a matter of can you implement it 
in your business application and your ecosystem. Small to mid-sized businesses tend to be consumed, understandably so, with solving their immediate problems. You know, they tend to look at their existing IT infrastructure, the software applications they have and so forth, and saying, well, what problems do we have right now today that we could solve if we could just fix this one thing with our existing software that works a little bit better? But the problem is it's very difficult to get out of that loop. If you continue to think short term, you're going to get short term results. If you really want to grow and be successful, then I think that the most important thing that you can do is to proactively monitor your environment. It starts, there are two or three things that you can do. And so the software investment is not so much in terms of purchasing a piece of software or leasing a piece of software as it is investing in the future of your software by gathering information. So you use tools and resources like Gartner and its counterparts in the market that help our analysts and help provide that kind of information. You also have very deep talks with your existing software providers. 